What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the final week of AJ's views on orthopedic surgical considerations. Uh, I apologize in advance for my hoarse voice. Uh, I'm currently a little under the weather and on the road again, um, so please bear with me. Might take take a sip of tea every once in a while. So um, let's dive in and let's start talking about this week's content because uh, I don't know how long my voice is going to last. So, um, this week we discussed the UCL reconstruction slash repair, however you want to coin it. Um, obviously, we know it was coined and developed Tommy John surgery. If if you're a baseball person like me, um, that's what you call it. Um, although, some of the articles we discussed this week said, oh, you may have to get away from calling it Tommy John because what was true Tommy John back then is not what the UCL reconstruction is now, which is fair. However, I'm going to still call it Tommy John because that's what I'm comfortable calling it as. <clears throat> but um, we know that it's typically characterized by overuse and high repetitive stress at the elbow, right? Typically, the elbow, anytime someone pitches, um, specifically if we look at Major League Baseball now or even um, in college baseball now, uh, every throw there's about 60 newtons of force that get applied at the elbow. So imagine 60 newtons of force over the course of 100 pitches in a game, how much repetitive stress that is. It's, and maybe if that pitcher pitches, you know, every third day, every fourth day, how, how that base can change. So a typical mechanism of injury for a UCL tear is going to be that overuse and high repetitive stress. But it can also be falling on an outstretched arm. I had an athlete, a couple, two athletes that I worked with in the previous that are, weren't uh, sport related. They were dance uh, related and fell on an outstretched arm. UCL was gone. Um, so definitely, definitely would definitely consider a, um, always consider a, a foosh mechanism as a possibility for a UCL, even though it's not common but it can be something something there as well. So we know that typical signs and symptoms are that pop that is heard or felt um, at the time of injury. Um, secondarily, there's going to be some numbness and tingling that is currently present, especially if there's going to be some issues or entrapment with that alder nerve. Um, and third, there's going to be some weakness um, in the forearm, especially um, in that flexor pronator group uh, because that Medial con epicondyle serves as the origin point for the uh, flexor pronator group. There may be some weakness there. So some things you definitely need to consider uh, in terms of evaluations, right? So one thing they talked about this week was the milking maneuver, right? I use the milking maneuver a lot in my clinical practice when I'm assessing UCL injuries. Uh, it is a phenomenal, phenomenal clinical test to have in your battery um, along with your typical uh, value stress test. For me, personally, I like to do the book maneuver and start off in this position here, which is, you know, a 90-90 position. Um, I will then place a load at the elbow, okay, providing a medial stress to the elbow and then ex slowly extending the arm, right? So it's like I'm extending and then providing that medial force at the same time. I also do it in like a crank maneuver type of way as well. Um, so there's a couple ways you can do it, um, but I I prefer those two ways over any, uh, and they given me great results thus far. I think every time I've suspected a UCL injury and I've used that those two variations, I've gotten a positive, and then MRI or diagnostic ultrasound has confirmed uh, what the situation has been. So. I want to talk more about the rehab. You know, we want to obviously want to talk about the surgical considerations, right? Obviously, we're always going to talk about infection. We're also going to talk about potential nerve injury with the ulnar nerve. Uh, we also want to talk about potential issues with the forearm musculature because you're cutting through so far on musculature as you're trying to not really, but maybe some stuff there. But I want to really talk about the rehab considerations because that is what's kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, that's what's kind of near and dear to my heart with this situation. Um, so, in terms of in terms of rehab, right? There's some things, and I'm gonna go through hit kind of the each different phase 
so let's start out with the intermediate phase first. I mean, excuse me, the early phase or immediate phase. We'll start off there first. The immediate phase first, right? Things you want to make sure you consider, right? You want to obviously make sure you're controlling for controlling for infection as, po as possible as you can. Um, obviously, you might not be able to do that. Like, you want to make sure that the wound is staying clean. But some things you want to consider, were there any injuries to the ulnar nerve? Uh, if there were, that may slow down your rehab process a little bit, especially in the beginning because there's some issue still. As the nerve heals, it causes some pain and discomfort. So that may slow down your rehab process. Two, you also want to make sure and address what the post-op restrictions are going to be for your patient. Every surgeon is different. I've seen several surgeons do something different all treating and doing the same surgery. So in terms of, hey, how long does this patient need to be in the post-op brace for? Does it need to be two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks? How quickly can we start to unlock the brace? Where can we do this? Where can we? So making sure you're having those conversations early and often with your um with your purse with your surgeon is key now let's move on to the intermediate stage one of the things that when i discuss with a lot of shoulder guys or elbow people or baseball people in general uh and clinicians who work baseball is proprioceptive work following a ucl injury it is very very important for you to consider the proprioceptive aspect um, in the rehab right a lot of patients that I've worked with in the past who have had a UCL injury um, before I got to them, uh, they talked to me about, hey, like, I just feel like my arm is just, I don't know, my arm is in space. So I mentioned this because if you can start at an earlier process in the rehab phase to make sure you're doing that proprioceptive work, that helps you far beyond you could ever, you could have really imagined. So it's important that you do proprioceptive work early and often, right? Incorporating rhythmic stave, incorporating um, some perturbation stuff, incorporating doing, you know, some single arm stuff, some eccentrics. All that stuff is definitely important, but the proprioceptive work is really, really, really important. And as we transition to the, like the advanced late stage of the rehab, um, you really want to consider making sure you have a sound and compact return to hitting program and a return to pitching program or throwing program. So your return to hitting program is going to look a little bit, is going to be very, obviously vastly different from your return to throwing or slash throwing program. Uh, typically a return to hitting program following UCL uh, repair will be come sooner than a throwing program will. Usually the hitting comes first. But for just pitchers, you want to make sure for the throwing program, you want to make sure that you have something sound in place. So, for an example, I something I did, we did three days a week, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We started them off at, hey, then we got, we starting off at the first week is just 30 feet, 10 light tosses a day, right? Those three days. Then the next week, we stayed at 30 feet and we progressed to maybe 15 to 20 tosses, Right? And this is all about maybe max 75% effort, really. Then the next week, we press to 60. The next week, we press to 90. The next week, we press to 120, 180, so forth and so on. Because um, as we want to make sure we're doing a slow, gradual ramp up. Now, as we know, in baseball, um, a typical return to play time for a pitcher who is about a year following their surgery so let's say if that surgery was May 25th in 2023 they're probably not coming back to the next following year which is May 25th 2024 uh, they do usually do a full calendar year now with hit position players it's a little bit different they don't throw as much and the stress at the elbow is a little bit different so and they change the arm angle a little bit so that takes a little bit of stress off the elbow puts it more at the shoulder that's another conversation for another day so, but they will have to do a return to hitting program and a return to throwing program as well. Uh, so those are some things that you definitely need to consider more in the late stages of the rehab. But again, this has been a great, 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 my voice is about to go out again. So this has been a great, 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 
great, great, great, great time. Um, so I hope you guys enjoy. Um, if you got any questions, as always, let me know.